Hi, everyone. Welcome to this talk about designing a DSL in Kotlin. Thanks to Stefan for reminding me it was this talk and not another one. I'm, uh, it's the first time I'm in Denmark, so thanks to be here. I'm Nicola Frankel. Um, I'm a consultant, so I am the kind of guy who wrecks a walk with your project and then runs away before it's too late. Um, that's how I earn my life. Um, I can also do fun stuff. Like I, I blog a lot, I write books, I talk sometimes, like here. I work for a little company uh, called SAP. Who, who doesn't know about SAP? Okay, that was Danish humor, right? Um, so um, I, I work on a, um, on a product called Hybris. Hybris is an e-commerce shop based on Java and Spring. So I do a lot of Java, I do a lot of Spring. I'm interested in doing better Java and better Spring. Hence this talk about Kotlin. And uh, well, if you are interested, you can, you can check. So the question is, what is a DSL? Huh? You have a lot of stuff about DSL, how you create a DSL, but what is a DSL? DSL, as its name implies, is a domain-specific language, and opposite to a general-purpose language, when you can do a lot of stuff, you chose to restrict the scope of what you can do in order to get better semantics, to get more adapted semantics to this little scope. And of course, Wikipedia tells it, and it's the truth. Um, for example, you have a, a, a lot of, already, you, you use a lot of GPL languages, like XML, for example, it's a general purpose language, and then you can use more specific domain-specific domain language, like MATML or HTML, which can be seen as a form of XML. And on the Java side, uh, there are already some uh, DSL for assertions, for example, You've got uh, ARM crests, a set for J. Those are dedicated DSL for assertions. So it's still Java, but basically the API restricts the domain, and then you've got very dedicated semantics. And on the Kotlin side, there is something called Anko, which uh, anybody here is an Android developer? No Android, one Android developer, two Android developers, three. Uh, let's wait a little more, perhaps there are more. Uh, four, yeah. It's like mushrooms, you start with one and then you see other ones. Um, so if you are an Android developer, you might know about Anko that replaces the XML, let's say, peculiarities of designing UIs with nice, domain-specific language, where you, it's really Kotlin code, but really adapted to that. And there's Cardin, which will be my example. So it will be based on Vardin. I will show you how you can do better Vardin application with, with Kotlin using a DSL. In, in Java, you are fairly limited if you want to create DSLs. Um, the basics is, yeah, you, you just do the sequencing, so you call the operation one after another, um, then you've got method chaining, like those kind of fluent stuff that uh, is generally is the hallmark of Java DSLs. So for example, instead of having uh, uh, setters, you've got this with methods that written this, and then you can say with X, with Y, with whatever. Uh, it's fluent. You can have nested method calls, you can have lambdas, and this is an example of uh, 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 Acer G, uh, if you have really used it. So you've got this fluent stuff. So you can chain your method. You don't need to repeat it ev at every line. And uh, you've got lambdas, and, and you've got also uh, uh, nested method calls. And all in all, it's better than you, if you would have like 20 lines of the st same stuff. But I mean, let's say, because there might be British people here, that there is room for improvement. And um, in Kotlin, 
you can do a lot better. Who doesn't know nothing about Kotlin? Okay, most of the room doesn't know nothing about Kotlin. So it's time for a little uh, Kotlin prep talk, the two minute pitch elevator. So Kotlin, uh, was made famous like three weeks ago at Google I.O. because Google told that, yeah, they would support Kotlin on Android. But Kotlin dates back to four or five years, I mean, the, the, the first drafts. And it's a language that is statically typed, that is very important, that's not a scripting language. Um, it was made originally for the JVM, so it compiles to bytecode, but now you can also compile it to JavaScript, transpile it to JavaScript. So you can have a full back-end, front-end project completely done in Kotlin. One part of the Kotlin code will translate to bytecode, the other will transpile to JavaScript. And now they are going even further and they make it possible um, that you uh, can have Kotlin code and then it compiles to native code. So you will have like real executable. So basically, they are starting to spread. Hmm? Um, so it was developed by GenBrains, and um, it seemed they want to do something for, for with Google after after wha what was announced at Google I/O. But it's still under GenBrains leadership, and it started very easily. It started because GenBrains. Uh, have this uh, um, IDE called uh, IntelliJ. I mean, they have a lot of different stuff, but they are based mainly on IntelliJ at the, at the core. And they wanted to have something that was more manageable than Java to, to maintain. Because when you have one million of the line of code of Java code, it's very hard. And so they realized that, I mean, they were not the first, but they realized that you take a lot more time during a project maintenance reading code than writing it. Hence, code should be very easy to read. And let's plot it bluntly, I mean Java is not the most readable code you can have. Depends on the team, depends on the people, but I mean, it's very easy to create crappy Java code. And so, they created for their own stuff, for their own inner team, the Scotland language, and they open source it, and now everybody can use it. And if you remember, perhaps three years ago, it was Kotlin, Ceylon, and Extend from Eclipse. You know about those languages? Who knows about Ceylon? Okay. Who knows about Extend? Okay, a few people. And there were, I mean, nobody cared about them. I mean, there was Java, everybody was doing Java. Scala was leading the stuff because, I mean, that's cool to, to do Scala, that it was cool. And I mean, there were new languages and nobody cared about them. And now, Extend, I don't know nothing about Extend anymore. I mean, nobody talks about Extend. I don't know no one that is really using Extend. Ceylon has been donated to the Eclipse Foundation not a really good sign. And Kotlin I mean, I, has been endorsed by Google. So, yeah, I let you draw your own conclusion. I've been doing some Scala some years ago. It changed my way to, um, to, to, um, to really write Java codes, but I found it much too complex, much too powerful to, to be given to a normal standard teams. And uh, for me, Kotlin is really the best because you cannot do all the things that you, do, you can do in Scala, for sure. So you can do a lot less mistakes than you can do in Scala. So for me, it's the right trade-off between powerful, readable, and, 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 uh, and simplicity. So Kotlin. Kotlin is both. And if you do already Scala, probably I will do the same, you already know the same, because they, they really took the, the good stuff out of Scala. It's functional and object-oriented. That means that, yeah, you can have your classes as you can have in Java, but you don't need, for example, to get a stream out of a collection to handle it in a functional way. 
it's backed into the API directly. If you know about the stream API, you know that you have a collection, then you get the stream, then you do all your functional programming stuff, and then you collect it. I mean, it's really super crappy. I, I mean, I understand the point. You, you, you need to have backward compatibility, but it's still not super great when you use it. So it's statically typed. Once you have an int, you have an int. Once you have a double, you have a double. Um, it's null safe. That is very important. There is a dedicated type for every type that tells you it can be null. So if you have a string, a string cannot be null. But if you have a string question mark, then it means this string can be null. And this is handled at compile time. And if you call a method or an attribute on a type that can be null, without checking first that it's null, that it can be null, then, of course, the compiler complains. He warns you, nay, I won't compile that, because here there might be a bug. Uh, no checked exception. Yeah, ex checked exception in Java were a good idea. Unfortunately, the implementation, uh, well, I don't know what you think about checked exception, but um, it's not super great. You've got named and optional arguments. So that's very, very useful. We will see how it works. Lambdas, of course. Extension functions, I will have a slide dedicated to this. And most important, very important, 100% Java compatibility. That means that you don't need to start a new project in Kotlin. You can have your old legacy project in Java and start rewriting bit by bit. And that is super, super great. No big bang. You can do it step by step. So this is a Vardin UI. Who knows about Vardin? Hey, that's great, guys. Half the room. Vardin is a best framework for web in Java because it, it lets you program web applications using only Java, no JavaScript, no nothing, no, no CSS. Really, you can, you can do, but by default, you can create a UI that runs on a web server, present that to your user only in Java. And even if you have no clue about Vardin here, you can already see that here I can set the theme, I create a new component, which is vertical layout, and if you have done any swing, you know how it works, right? Uh, horizontal layout, vertical layout, and then I create a label, which is of type HTML, and then I create a text field, I add those two components to the vertical layout, so there will be then first the label, then the field, and then I say a margin around, and I set it at the content, I mean, and that's pretty good DSL, right? That's a pretty good DSL to define a UI. So I want to do better, but in Kotlin. So I want to create a DSL that looks declarative, like it could be JSON or whatever, but is really code, so I can have loops, I can have whatever I want. So this is something I could create. And this is what our goal will be. Mm -hmm. I want to create a DSL using Kotlin features to have this result. OK? Right, that's good if you agree at this point, because otherwise I can leave now. OK. So which feature can we leverage? That's what we'll see right now. And now I have my IntelliJ ID, and I have this stuff, and I just need to reset that. Sorry, two seconds, please. Uh-oh, untracked file. 
doesn't work. So I will just remove it. Sorry. Now that's what I want to have. So this is the code that I showed you, right? And um, the problem with this code is that it's, in my opinion, hard to read. Why is that hard to read? Because I can, I can change the order of some stuff. It still compiles. It still does the same stuff. But depending on your personal uh, feeling or way to code, it can be unreadable to some people in your teams. Even worse, um, here, if I change that, I change the order in which my components will be added to the layout, so it will change the graphical display, and it's very easy to change it that way. It's too easy, I would say. So, and here I only have two components. And most UI, well, they probably have more, unless you are Google or Apple. But if you do a, 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 your own personal uh, business application, you probably have a lot of fields, like 25. Then you have to read through that. So, of course, if you do like object-oriented programming, you will create dedicated components, and that's good. That's good. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that many people do that. Hmm. So, I will create my class, and I will say it's a class, and that will be a Kotlin UI. Oof. And so here, I extend the UI, so I will do the same here. And I'm just following IntelliJ IDA warning because it's super easy, because that's also a very good advantage of using the language is you have the tooling. The tooling is very important. So that's how I declare a class in Kotlin. And as you can see here, the class declaration is really bounded to the constructor invocation. Because in Java, First, you declare the class, and then you declare your constructors. Most of the time, however, you only have one single constructor. So here, it's everything in one place, and if you need to add more constructor, you can still do it. Here, you can say that it's a request, and that's what I told you about uh, the nullable type is here, that you have this question mark. And this question mark, means, hey, I'm not sure, but probably it can be null. And here I know that the framework won't pass null here, so I can write it like that. Okay, so far so good. Here, the first time that I do is setting a theme. So I can just, because I'm super lazy, just do a quick copy-paste, and it works. That's also a super good with the tooling. If you copy Java code in a Kotlin class, it will just change the code to Kotlin. It's not 100% bulletproof, but it works pretty well in most of the kits. And here, I've got a nice information telling me, hey, but perhaps you should do something else. So let's see what it tells me. Oh, God, what happened? That's how Kotlin manages setters and getters as well. That means if you have a set xxx, you don't need to call a method. I mean, you can if you really want, but it makes it very easy to understand that this is a setter. Works for you? Okay. Now we will create a component. Let's say a label. Ah, that's also something I forgot. You don't have uh, semicolons. Huh? Because, I mean, you have carriage return, so that's, you, you, can, you can write them, actually. Huh? It's just that it's completely useless. 
you can have this label stuff. So here, for example, I created a label instance of type label that is a label. Uh, OK, but really, I know this is a label guy. I don't really do I need to have the type. Oh, probably not. Probably you don't need the label. That's completely useless. So that's what you want to do. Or you can create a text, likewise. Where is ah? It's not. It's text field. Sorry, ah, I don't remember the same stuff. And afterwards, I will create a layout. And it's a vertical layout. I will add. The components, texts, and I can set the content to layouts. OK? So far, so good. But I mean, it's just syntactic sugar. It's not about DSL. It's just about translating my UI to Kotlin. What can we do better? Well, it would be great if I created a function, actually, to create the layout. So here, I want to create a method or a function. And I will call it vertical layout. And here, it's good because it can be inside the class or outside the class. That's a very good thing about Kotlin, is that you are not forced to create your code inside of classes. And then now your, yeah, I, your eyebrows are making movements because, I mean, what? You are creating methods outside of classes. That is not object oriented, right? And object oriented rules the world. Do we agree on that? Who here doesn't create object oriented code? Yeah, everybody does. No, uh, they are, yeah, they are honest people. Sometimes I don't create object-oriented code. I create, yeah, imperative code. I hate myself for that, but the thing is, what you want to do most of the time is you create object-oriented code, but in some cases it doesn't work. In which case doesn't it work? In the case where you create utility classes, who here has never created or used a utility classes? No one? Really? Hey, who are the people who told me they created object-oriented code? So, object-oriented code, utility classes. Uh, either one or the other, a utility class, I'm sorry, is not object-oriented. And still, you create a lot, ah, I would say, you create some of them, OK? So what could happen? So here, I create that, and I want to pass the UI. And I will create, sorry, not this way, but this way. I want to create a vertical layout. I was be be being a bit too quick. I want to assign it to a variable, and I want to set the content of that to the vertical layout. So I can remove that stuff, and I can remove that one as well. And I will return also here the vertical layout. Don't be too smart. And it tells me I should return something, so it's, it works. OK, that's, that's object-oriented, right? 
Yes? Yes or no? No, why? Why is it functional? Okay, here I, I still need to pass the UI, right? There is a problem there. I need to pass the UI. And yeah, you are right. I, I don't do anything. So I remove it outside the class. I, it's okay. But probably I can do something good here. I can do something like that. Uh, sorry, not here, but here. <sighs> really great. That is mind-blowing. That is the concept of extension, in that case function, but you can do the same for attributes. I can talk about it for one hour, really. It's m even if you don't like Kotlin, that's the only reason you should use it. Extension function. Here, this is really object-oriented code. You might know about the Scala's implicit. You need something, and because you import it, it comes into the scope, and then it transforms a type in another type. It's called implicit. I hate that word. I mean, my job from day to day is to make things explicit. The guys backed the implicit keyword into the language. That's evil. Anyway, let's talk about the good stuff. You have a need for extensibility for existing APIs. You want something that makes existing APIs extensible. And if you want to add behavior to an existing class, a class that sits outside your reach in Java, you cannot do it. You cannot extend string because string is final. You cannot extend most API because their types, they are there and you cannot do anything about them. So you create string utils classes. Huh? Reminds you something. So the Scala language, I mean, they have a way of using extensibility by transforming the string into their own string. But Kotlin does it differently. It lets you add behavior through this extension function. In the end, if you look at the bytecode, it will be just a utils function in the bytecode. So if you call it from Java, ah, too bad. But if you call it from Kotlin, then it looks like it's object-oriented. And that is really, for me, one of the best things I know about Kotlin. OK? Any questions on that one? Yes. Exactly. So that means that's a very good comment. That means that you don't have access to the protected, private, and whatever. You only have access to the public one. Because in the end, the bytecode is just utils. But it makes your, ob your code more object-oriented. And here, since this function is private, you can only access it from this file. Of course, you can define it in another file with more uh, uh, open access. But yeah, another question? Yeah. So the question is about scoping. And of course, in that case, since the, 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 the modifier is private, then you can only have this ui.radical UI layout inside of the file. Whereas if you put it in another file and say there is, a, for example, a modifier internal, then it's scoped to your package. OK? And now what I would like to do, I would like to add here stuff and say, yeah, uh, text field. So I want to add a text field here that says the world. 
that's what I would like to have. So I want to open these uh, curly braces and add stuff inside of it. Hmm? How can we do that? Well, here, first, we can create a lambda here. So you can, we, we can create, so here it doesn't compile, we can create uh, something that's a function that returns unit, and it will be called init. So that makes the compiler at least happy. I can remove that one. And here, what I can do is I need to apply what is inside the curly braces to the vertical layout. Ah, there's me something wrong, yeah. Because here, it takes nothing and it returns units. But, because I described to you extension function, I can say, this stuff can be applied to a vertical layout. Not bad. And finally here, I can have my text field. And the good thing here is that now I can have whatever I, I create here, it, it, they will be taken in the order. What perhaps is missing is the set margin equals true. So in, 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 in Vardin, you can define your margin and, and your spacing, so like in CSS, uh, I, I, with the API. So what I would like here is that the vertical layout takes uh, a sparsing and margin, right? So I would say true and false, for example. And then they will apply the spacing and the margin. Okay? Okay. So what I need to have here is to have spacing boolean and margin boolean. I will just make it like so that it's more readable. And afterwards, I can say, okay, vertical layout. Here, I will first create a first apply, and then only a second apply. I have one curly braces too much, and it should be good. And so I will say, okay, on the vertical layout, so inside of apply, this is this. So I can say this dot spacing is spacing equals spacing. And this dot margin. And here I think I need to create a margin info. And with the margin boolean. Works for you? It's just the API, right? Now, I put myself in the shoes of the user. Who can tell me, without looking at the lower screen, if the first boolean is spacing or if the first boolean is margin? I do not remember, me neither. No, I know it's spacing in the first, but it's because I've done this demo before. The problem is you have no clue if you have multiple parameters of the same type, which one they actually refer to. So if you are doing object-oriented programming, what do you do? Hey guys, you are the developers, I'm just a consultant. What are you doing? You wrap them generally. You wrap them into an a spacing object and a margin object. Hey, super cool for your user. At least they, they cannot make mistakes, but I mean you create object, object, object. And okay, 
But here, what I can do instead I can set the parameters, name. Yes? There is nothing special. I mean, it's just the example that I, I used here because I don't want my user to create this object, for example. More importantly, uh, of course, you might, whoop, what did I do? Uh, what did I do? Um, you, you can change the order, you don't care. And if you are using IntelliJ and having Java projects, you might notice that IntelliJ is adding the name of the parameters when you have multiple uh, values of the stem type directly. Uh, they, they, they just copied what they did in Kotlin in the language, in the IDE. That's pretty smart. And now, what I want is I want that my user might be able to call me like that, or like that, Oop, again, sorry, or with only one parameter. How would you do that in Java? Sorry? Multiple signature, overriding or overloading, I never, I, I always mistake. So you create more code that calls upon itself. Right? Well, let's say that, but I don't want that. I want my code to be simple to understand. So I can have default values. And that is so simple now. That is so simple. There is no tr trouble with that. Okay? What can I show you more? Um, here, I can also don't want anything inside of it. And it tells me, hey, you don't pass anything. Here, in the signature, it's mandatory. Okay, no problem. By default, my lambda will be empty. And then it's, it's happy again. And what I did here, I can do exactly the same for, yeah, it doesn't work like that. In that case, it would be like this. I, I, I can do exactly the same with the text field. So I will use the extension function to say that, um, the text field can be added to layout. So it's vertical layout. And here I will say it's a text field. And by default, I will say hmm, text of type string equals empty string or whatever, or perhaps anything you want. OK? And then I say OK. I will create the text field here. Text field equals text field. I will initialize it with the text here. And I will add it to the vertical layout. This dot add component text field. And I can replace that with text field. Uh, hello, world. How do you like it? And now, I cannot change and say, OK, I will declare a text field, and I will put this text field there. Doesn't work. doesn't work anymore. And if I'm not interested in what happens inside the vertical layout, I can just hide it. And I only have the high-level components. I can only check what is in the rest of me, because it's so neatly organized now.
Works for you? What can we do more? Well, I can show you something also in Kotlin, is that I can use the so-called expression body. So for you user, it's perhaps not super interesting, but for the creator of uh, the library, it's super great. So you can replace here. I, oh, that's, I forgot to say it will return the text field. Are you not following? You are too hungry? OK. OK, this is normally what I should do. What I can do here is I can remove the written type if I create an expression body. An expression body is super simple. If I do fun foo that return a string, and I return foo, I can say transform it into an expression body and have this kind of stuff. So for one-liners, it's pretty interesting. And in that case, of course, the type here, it's readable. It's, it's of type string, so you can say it works too like that. Well, here, it's also super easy because it's a text field, and we just can apply something like that. And so here we say this doesn't work anymore because in that case it's this and I forgot to say something here. So here is a text field, here is a vertical layout and you say like this, this. Afterwards, you can format it to have it like you want. And here, you s I mean, you see that it's a text field, so you don't need to, again, say that you will... Oh, there is some comments. It's not clear. It's not clear. I should redo it. Okay. No. Okay, here... I started from here, right? OK, now I say, I want this text field to be what I return, right? So what I can do is first I can apply. So apply is very easy. It's a function that you see use this, it's called a, a lambda receiver, so it will be on type T. So T is the same as the stuff that you apply. So here it's a text field, so here it will be a text field. Uh, returns units like we did before. And it will call the code that is inside it. So now the problem that we have is that before this was the vertical layout, but here you have two lambda receivers, one inside each other. Uh, don't worry. I mean, if you have done any JavaScript, you don't need to say that equals this and then use that. You can use this but you see that there is a special stuff to tell you, hey, which this do you want? So you can say this dot add component. And in that case, then the text will become the this. It's for, it's for the writer or the library. If you are comfortable with that, you can use it. If you are not comfortable, just don't use it. Um, my point was just here, I just didn't want to uh, set the type explicitly because I might be lazy. But for you, it's, it's important, then you can do it. For me, that kind of stuff can be a one-liner. For you, it's up to you, really. This one, probably, I won't, I won't change because there is already some logic here that might be very complex to put into a one-liner. But here I say, okay, perhaps. Then I will add more code inside of it and realize, hey, yeah, then the one liner doesn't work so well anymore, so I get back. And I mean, it's the end of the stuff. Um,
So the question, perhaps you are Groovy lovers, and you say, but hey, why don't you use Groovy? So first is whatever you use and you are happy with, continue with that, even if it's Gradle. If you're happy with Gradle, please keep Gradle. So if you are happy with Groovy, use Groovy. My point is the problem that I have with Groovy, it's a scripting language. So that means that, yeah, it's not as reliable for full uh, application as I would like, so I prefer my languages to be statically typed. If you are happy with Groovy, use Groovy. Why not Scala? <coughs> really? Ah, because you can write that in Scala. You can write basic in Scala. So if you are happy with Scala, if you are a, 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 a Scala master, and if you have a PhD in mathematics, please use Scala. And me, I'm just an average developer, and, and my, my brain is limited by my, uh, by my skull, so I prefer to use something that is uh, much, much uh, more um, pragmatic. So takeaways to this talk. Uh, why use Kotlin? In, why create Kotlin in a, a DSLs in Kotlin? First, you have 100% Java interoper interoperability. Vardin is a Java API. It's provided as is. Then you've got properties that I didn't mention. Then you've got extension functions that I mention a lot because they are, perhaps, if you want to use Kotlin, there might be the, the argument that makes you take the step. You can have name parameters. As you see, uh, that is very easy to prevent mistakes. You have default values. And I showed you about the lambdas with receiver where you can use the curly braces and ex execute some code inside of it, which makes a nice DSL. Two stuff that I didn't mention that might be interesting to you. In Kotlin, you have operator overloading, but the well-behaved kind. I mean, it's like in Groovy. You only are available with a limited set. You cannot create an emoji language DSL, like in Scala, you could. You don't have to think about what this mean, bang, bang, she, bang, uh, ash, bang, and whatever. Yeah, it's not possible. You cannot create those methods. In Kotlin, you have plus, minus stuff that mostly all programmers know what it's about. And you have the infix notation where uh, if you have only one argument in your function, then you can omit the dot and the parent and, and the braces and just have a space. That can be also pretty useful. There is a, a Kotlin a test framework which chooses it. So uh, here are some references to my blog, to my Twitter account, if you, uh, if you want to hire me, because uh, Denmark in Denmark salaries are pretty good, well, my LinkedIn. And uh, more importantly, uh, the, the link to, uh, to the repo with the DSL, where you can play with, with, with uh, around if you want. Any more questions? Are you, are you too hungry? Ah, sorry for you, but there is one question. There is always one. Yes, please. So the question is whether Java is less readable than Kotlin. So the question is whether there are, if it's harder to read, if you have multiple ways to write the same code. So if you are the library creator, it's up to you to decide. Now my point is, as the, the API user, as you can see, it makes your code much better to read. And that's if you create a DSL, you accept for one part of your team to handle the complexity so that the other part of your team got the readability. I mean, that's the point of the DSL, right? Does it answer your question? Not so much. We will talk afterwards. Another question.
Okay, so the question, the comment, because it's not a question, it's uh, does uh, terse uh, brevity equals readability? And I completely agree with you. That for a long time, and I still don't think that the less characters you write, the more readable it is. I mean, that's the problem with Scala. Hey, let's write into uh, one function with one character, like bang, and everybody knows what bang means, right? Uh, no, no, I don't. Um, I, I completely agree. Um, but on the other side, you also have to take into account that uh, you are not familiar with Kotlin. And of course, if Kotlin uh, was a gift from the gods, uh, probably you would understand in like uh, 50 minutes what it's all about. And this talk was not about Kotlin in general. It's more about creating a DSL in Kotlin. So if you are not familiar with Kotlin in the first place, of course, I understand that, of course, it's more complicated. But I hope that the half of the room who already knew a little about Kotlin was more clear. <laughs> or perhaps I should have made a more general uh, talk about Kotlin in general, but I mean, I, I'm not a JetBrains advocate. Um, so uh, again, you, you can check the link uh, uh, that is here. It's about the Cardin library, which you can parse. If you already know, already know Vardin, there is a sampler also that you can check, and that highlights how you would use the library in what I developed. And I believe that it, if you are using Vardin, I mean, it really makes your, your, your UI much more readable. Yeah, I think it's time, because you probably are super hungry now. Thank you very much.